Well, how about we start 20 seconds early tonight? <laughs> well, I hope your Monday was a good one, and uh, welcome to the second evening of our revival services. If you missed yesterday, you missed out, but the good news is that we have them all recorded. You can watch them online, and I know you'll be blessed and encouraged, and I'm excited about what the Lord's going to do tonight. So welcome to all, all of you in the auditorium, those who have joined us via our live stream, a special welcome to you as well. And I was thinking, this, this could be the last time uh, Brother Hooks and Sister Melanie come north of the Mason-Dixon line after what's fixing to happen in these next couple of days. You're going to see some white stuff, apparently shovelable white stuff. You may never want to come this way again, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, uh, we thought that stuff was behind us. Maybe the Lord will kind of blow it to the north or something, but... Uh, I'm feeling for all my f beautiful flowers that have been poking through the ground and showing color, and now they're going to be covered in snow. But the Lord is good, and I'm expecting something good tonight. So if you're able, let's stand. We will open in prayer, and then uh, Brother Bill will come and lead us in a few of our great hymns of the faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've done already in our midst in these services that we had yesterday. and. We're certainly looking forward to a good service tonight. Lord, challenge us from your word. Lord, bless your messenger. Uh, continue to give him the, the words, the message that you would have for us as a church, as individuals. May we be open to uh, your working in our lives to uh, deal with things that, uh, that need to be dealt with. And Lord, may uh, we have a soft heart and allow you to continue to mold us into the image of your dear son. So Father, again, we honor you tonight as a, as a guest in our midst with liberty to, to work in our hearts and through the, the mouth of our preacher. And may everything that's said and done here be honoring and glorying to you this evening. And Father, we ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're able to remain standing, let's do that. We're going to sing Like a River Glorious as we get started this evening. as we sing heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Thank you. 
saying God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, it's not very impressive to us, but back in the day, that meant something. That was the riches of God beyond what a normal person could ever imagine. Let's sing that. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. evening I get to once again welcome back after we have a special here from the uh, what, what is this like the Horton family what are we calling it the duet that's good I, I heard them practice we're all we're all excited about I want you should be excited about what's gonna happen and now I have built it up and now they're mad at me but it was blessing last night when I heard it so ladies take it away and then my good friend brother Scott if you just come on up after the songs done Deep is pain 
That was a blessing, wasn't it? Thank you, ladies, for that song. I'd like for you to take God's word and go with me to the New Testament, to the book of James, James chapter number five. James chapter number five. We'll begin reading in verse number 13, James chapter number five, in verse number 13. And uh, we're bracing for the blizzard. <laughs> that apparently is coming Wednesday. And uh, so uh, you pray for my wife and I. If we're out here making snowmen and trying to find a hill to sled on, we haven't seen a lot of snow in North Carolina uh, this year. I don't think in the last two we've had uh, very much snow. And uh, I like it that way. Uh, I just look at pictures of your Facebook posts and I'll be content. Uh, during the winter, uh, but uh, we are, at least we got a, a warm day today, and I think this is the first time I've been up here when we've seen green on the trees, so I'm, I'm really encouraged, and I know it can happen, <laughs> and that's good. I've always felt so sorry for all of you people, thinking that you live year-round with gray skies and no leaves on the trees and brown grass, but I know it's not true. I know it's not true. We're in James chapter number 5 and verse number 13. We'll begin reading in just a moment. I, again, I want to say what a blessing it is to be here. And I see some of you that I didn't see yesterday. I'm glad to see you. It's good to see familiar faces. And my wife and I, I have grown over the years to, to really enjoy uh, being here with you and love, uh, love being here with you. Thank God for you and your faithfulness. Thank the Lord for your pastor and his wife and how God is using them here and Brother Steve and his family and how God is using him. And to see all of you here in your place, what a blessing that is. It's encouraging, isn't it, uh, to meet Christians from across the country and know that there are people just like us, uh, maybe a little bit different, hopefully, right? But they're just like us. They love the Lord. They're on their way to heaven. Isn't that a blessing to know? And so not everybody, you know, there was the prophet who said, Lord, I'm the only one left. And we get to feeling that way sometimes, don't we? I mean, we, we've got to be about the only people left. But the Lord said, no, there's 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And I'm glad that there are many, many faithful Christians all across the landscape of our country. And thank God for it. And I'm encouraged by you, encouraged to be with you. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. I'm praying that God would speak to our hearts this evening. We're in James chapter number 5 and verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. and The Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not upon, uh, or rained not rather on the earth by the space of three years 
and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I want you to notice what the Bible says here in verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. I want to speak to you on that subject this evening. Let him pray. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, the opportunity that we have to meet together. And the people who are here tonight and those who are watching online who could not be here. Father, we know that many of, of the dear people of this church have worked in their jobs and labored and uh, went to school and, and came home in haste and got ready and now here they are. I pray that you would encourage them and strengthen them in these moments. I pray that by your spirit you would speak to us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to hear your word. And this encouraging invitation that is given to us in the midst of our affliction, in the midst of our difficulty, in the midst of our sickness and our sorrow, we can come to you and pray. So, Father, with your disciples, we ask you, Lord Jesus, tonight to teach us to pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, to say uh, the least, uh, we have been busy. We've, uh, as a church, no doubt you've been busy trying to get ready for a meeting and praying for God to work and in the ministries is now that you have two services and two Sunday schools. Uh, uh, there's a lot to be done, is there not? And by the way, there will always be a lot to be done and we ought to be glad that there's a lot to be done. Thank God for that. And we think about the goals that we set, and those are good. We think about the plans that we make, and those are good. We think about the organization that is required to accomplish such tasks, and that's good. Policies that are needed, programs that must be implemented, all of that is good. Work is good. And as we learned in the book of Nehemiah, that uh, Nehemiah was leading the people and engaging them in God's good work. We find out with all the things that we have to do in our lives, not only in the context of the church, but in the context of our home, bringing up our kids, running our errands, going to work, all the things that must be done. It seems that the, there is never a shortage of things that must be done. All the tasks that we must perform. Let me just say to you, as we learned yesterday morning, the priority of all of the tasks that we have is our prayer life. What a wonderful opportunity God has given us to pray. And the invitation comes here in verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That means that prayer accomplishes great things. Do you believe that tonight? Prayer accomplishes great things. Now, sometimes we get too busy to pray. Or at least that's the excuse that we make. I've got so much to do, I don't have time to stop and pray. Well, we better learn to make that time. Because here's what we find. The most important time that we spend is the time that we spend in prayer. The most important exercise that we engage in, the most important activity that we engage in, the most important work that we're involved in is the work of prayer. And here's what you can rest in is that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now yesterday morning we looked at Nehemiah and we saw that the work of God was a work that was conceived in prayer. While he was praying, God put it in his heart to do the task. We find that it was a work that 
continued in prayer while the opposition uh, raged against Nehemiah and the people. They continued to work and they continued to pray and God provided all that was needed. Then we see that the work was completed in prayer. In chapter 6 and verse number 15 of the book of Nehemiah, the Bible says, So the wall was finished, and it was finished in 52 days. And when the enemy saw that the wall had been completed, the Bible says that their soul was much cast down because they perceived that the work was wrought of our God. It was performed by God. In 52 days, two miles of wall, maybe a little bit more, had been constructed They'd started 13 years earlier and couldn't get the job done, but now they get it done in 52 days. They cleared away all the debris. They didn't have a, you know, a caterpillar uh, tractor and, and uh, a bulldozer to do that task. They didn't have all that stuff. But in 52 days, they cleared that debris. In 52 days, they got the materials there. In 52 days, they organized the work. They drew up the plans. They took them to the planning commission. They got them approved. In 52 days, the workers and the laborers got the job done in the face of constant opposition, threats, turmoil, and division. God led them to do the task. In 52 days, the walls were complete. You see, prayer availeth much. What is it that God wants to do in your life? I believe it's more than you can even perceive. What is it that God wants to do in your church? I believe it's greater than you can imagine. And do you believe that God is able to perform those things which he wants accomplished? I want to tell you that he is able. God is able. God is able tonight. In the midst of a pandemic situation, in the midst of the turmoil and the upheaval, in the midst of uh, the falling away that we're experiencing in our nation, I want to tell you that God is able to do a mighty work. And if he's going to do it, then we have got to learn to pray. Nehemiah learned this task, this task of prayer. I want you to know that we're engaged in a a spiritual battle. Have you learned that yet? We've been active as a church trying to conduct the work of the ministry. But let me just tell you, while you've been active, the devil and his angels are active too. He's been coming against the children of God. He's been attacking the work of God. He's attacking homes. He's attacking children and young people. He's after marriages, trying to divide them and destroy them. He wants to destroy your witness and your testimony. People are suffering all across our land and in our churches, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And so Satan knows that his time is short and he is working feverishly. Let me tell you, he is working feverishly right now in this moment to hinder the work of God. Ought we not to be working? And ought we not to be working in the field of prayer? In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10, the apostle Paul wrote, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, there's a great temptation to think that our enemies are other people. People who don't know God and who do not love God. Uh, People who mock and ridicule and withstand the church of the living God. But they're not our enemies. Our enemy is the devil. He has blinded them. He is deceiving them. He is using them. But he is our enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want to tell you something. I imagine most of you have recognized this by now, but we are no match for the devil. He's smarter than us. He's more powerful than us. He's more persistent than we are. I'm no match for him. I do not have the strength to oppose him. And by the way, he's got a friend in me. And you know what that friend is called? It's my flesh. And then he's got another ally. That's the world. 
And he uses these two things against me constantly. And he wears me down and he wears you down. We're in a spiritual battle. So what should we do? Well, we better take, as he tells us in verse 13 of Ephesians 10, he said, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, we need the truth of God's word. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, we need to keep our heart, we need to be right with God, we need to protect our heart. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, we need to be ready to go with the gospel. Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I have to learn to trust God and believe God, even when circumstances dictate otherwise. Even when Satan comes at me with his fiery darts. I've got to rest in my faith. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Boy, I'm going to tell you, the battlefield for you is, if, as a believer is the mind. Boy, Satan wars against the mind, doesn't he? The thoughts that come into our mind, uh, that's a constant battle. So we need to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Verse 18, here's where I'm going with all of this. Praying always. How often? Praying always. That means I don't ever stop. Now that doesn't mean I, I, I never move. It doesn't mean I'm on my knees with my head bowed, my eyes closed every moment of the day. It means that I'm staying in an attitude of prayer. If you read through the book of Nehemiah, you're going to find that he had been praying, as he said, night and day. But once the construction begins, he's working night and day. But as he's working night and day, let me tell you something else he's doing. He's praying. He's praying as he works. For years I, I worked for UPS and, and uh, I know you have a, a, a dear uh, man here in your church who works uh, at UPS and um, I remember uh, working at UPS and, and serving in my church as, as much as I could, uh, doing the very best I could with the situation I had. And I'm going to tell you some of the best times I ever had with the Lord was in that truck. Now, I wasn't in a city route most of those times because on those city routes, you, you were just hopping from business to business and door to door. But on some of those country routes where I could drive a little bit between stops, I had some of the best times. I had my eyes open. I had my hands on the wheel. But I was praying. I was talking to the Lord. Do You know, you can talk to God no matter where you are. At the job, you can talk to God. At the house, cooking the meal, you can talk to the Lord. In school, you can talk to the Lord. Taking a test, Lord, help me to remember everything I studied. You know, this kid's picking on me. Help me not to respond in the wrong way. You know, we can be in constant fellowship with the Lord. That's what he's saying here in verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, I want you to note some things about prayer tonight. And this invitation that we have, let him pray. I'm going to give you three thoughts. Number one, I want you to see prayer that is personal, prayer that is powerful, and this is the heart of what I want to say to you tonight, prayer that is powerful, and then prayer that is profitable. Well, let's just look, first of all, at this thought, prayer that is personal. We're back in James chapter 5 and verse number 13. I just want to highlight a few phrases in these opening verses. He says here in verse 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Verse 14, is any sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. And the prayer of, uh, in verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. 
Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Here we have the context of the New Testament church and the different circumstances that come to our lives. And here's the invitation to us, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves dealing with, whether it's afflictions or trials or, or sickness or if we're happy and rejoicing or if we're talking to one another about our faults, we are all invited individually to come in the midst of those circumstances and pray. So here we find prayer that is personal. It's for you. It's not for somebody else, although it is for somebody else. It's not just for somebody else. This is for you. Now let me just give you a few thoughts about this. Number one, it is applicable. It's applicable to what you're dealing with in your life in this circumstance, in this moment. I have no idea the trials that many of you are facing. Uh, the sicknesses, the burdens, the heartaches, the troubles at home, the troubles at work, uh, the fears, the temptations, the struggles in your life. I have no idea. But let me tell you, God knows. And God has invited you to pray. An invitation to speak to Him. What a glorious thing. Number one, it's glorious that He has spoken to you. But secondly, it is glorious that he wants to hear from you. As the lady saying, God cares about you and what you are dealing with. And so it's applicable to you. You can come to him in prayer. Here's another thought. It's not only applicable, but it's available. Verse 13, he said, let him pray. Again, he said, let him sing psalms. Verse 14, let him call. Verse, again, verse 14, let them pray over him. Verse 16, pray one for another. And then he gives us an example in verse 17. Elias or Elijah prayed earnestly. Verse 18, and he prayed again. Let me just tell you, prayer is available to you. What a glorious thing. You know, there's not many times I leave the house without this crazy thing. And, and, and I, I'm glad I have it most days. But the reason I need it is because I need to stay available. Today my phone has been blowing up. People in Hickory, North Carolina need to talk to me. And I need to talk to them. And every once in a while, every once in a while, I try to call somebody and they don't answer. They're not available. Or maybe somebody tries to call me and I don't answer. I'm not available. Let me just tell you that God is always available. He's always available to us. The God of this universe who's spoken into existence. Who has a lot of things to deal with and a lot of people to care about and care for. is always available to you and I. Oh, that we would come to him in prayer. Prayer that is personal. Is applicable. It's available. Let me just say this to you. It's advisable. It's a good idea. It's advisable. I, I would advise you to do it. Verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Are you going through something hard, difficult, trouble, strife? God says let him pray. Is any merry? Are you happy about something? I don't know if most Baptists are happy about much of anything these days, but maybe a few of you are. I'm kidding a little bit. Well, when you're happy, you know what you ought to do? You ought to sing psalms. Just sing and praise the Lord Jesus. There's some dear folks in our church, and they like to whistle. And... You know why they like to whistle? Because they got joy in their heart. Sometimes when I don't have as much joy in my heart, I don't like to hear them whistle. <laughs> but the reason they're whistling is they've got the peace of God and the joy of God. Hey, we ought to sing songs. We ought to enjoy being a Christian. We're on the winning side. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. You know, it's just a good idea. It's a good thing to pray. Why? Because as we've already learned, prayer availeth what? 
much. Gets a lot done. And so we see prayer that is personal. But let's go secondly to this truth. And this is really where I want to, us to look tonight. We see prayer that is powerful. Prayer that is powerful. You know, we hear about people who can really get a hold of God. Prayer warriors. And then we think about our own lives and our own thoughts and our own hearts and our prayer life. And, and maybe we don't measure up to those people. I'm one of those people that don't measure up. But the Bible tells me that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, I want to tell you that I, I'm not a righteous man on my own. I'm a sinner. And you are too. So, well, how do you know that? Because you're here and we're people and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We all have a sin nature. We all commit sin. We all have bad attitudes at times. We say things we, we shouldn't say. We do things we should not do. The Apostle Paul said, I try to do the right thing, but I don't do it. And I try not to do the wrong thing, but I keep doing it. Do any of you identify with him? So when we think about a righteous man, we think about a guy that's a really good guy, and he sort of deserves to get his prayers answered. Because he's a really good guy. But I'm not that guy. And you're not either. What has made us righteous? It is our position in Christ. It is the work of the Lord Jesus, our high priest, whoever lives to make intercession for us. Who with his own blood purchased our access into the presence of God. And therefore when God sees us, he doesn't see us in our sin. He sees us in the standing of his son. And we are made righteous in him. Hey, that's good news. You can smile about that. He's made you righteous. Now you know you're a sinner. And he, he used to know that. But now he doesn't because he has made you righteous. You know, when I look at my grandson, Bennett, he's a little manipulative. He knows how to talk to me to get exactly what he wants. And when he doesn't get it, he knows how to, you know, throw the fit or use the charm. It depends on the mood he's in. But normally he knows how to get exactly what he wants. And other people may look at him and say, well, that little kid, he's spoiled. And that little fella, somebody needs to teach him a lesson. But when I look at him, I just overlook all of that. God sees us as he sees his son. And he delights in us. And he's made us righteous. So we can pray as righteous people. Yes, we sin, but we can confess that sin. We can keep that relationship where it ought to be. But then I see another dilemma here. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Now, I know I've been made righteous in the Lord Jesus, but I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I'm an effectual fervent prayer. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I would imagine that most of us do really not, feel, we don't really feel like uh, we are effectual, fervent prayers. Now, what is this speaking of here, effectual, fervent? The, the expression here has the idea of energy. Now, I was raised in the South, and I've been in those prayer meetings and, and camp meetings where uh, you have people praying all together at the same time, and one guy's praying, and he's trying to outpray the guy next to him, and this guy's trying to pray a little bit louder, and, and this guy's repeating the same thing over and over again. And, and, and you feel like after a while, you know, you're in a race to see who can pray the longest and who can pray with the most enthusiasm and energy. That's not what he's speaking of here. This is not a show that we're trying to put on. This is not the energy of our flesh 
to try to show God how serious we are. This is the energy of the Holy Spirit of God. The only reason you want to pray is because the Holy Spirit of God is in you. You see, great is the power and strength of a godly person's supplication. And it avails much in its outworking. It releases tremendous power. The effectual fervent prayer, when we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you something. As we turn to Romans chapter 8, would you turn there with me? I have to be honest with you this evening. Much of my praying seems very, very weak. There are times when I go to pray and as soon as I get on my knees, a number of things may happen. Number one, I may get distracted. Have you ever gotten distracted while you're praying? I start thinking about all the things I need to do. Number two, I get uncomfortable. <laughs> Number three, I run out of things to say. Number four, I get sleepy. Do you ever get sleepy? Have you ever fallen asleep praying? I have a little study in the back of our, our church auditorium. And um, when I really want to get away from everybody, I can kind of sneak back there and find a place where I can study and not be interrupted, every once in a while a knock will come on the door. And there's some red chairs back there, and I'll lean on those red chairs. I'll get down on my knees, and I'll, I'll, I'll have my elbows on those red chairs. And you know, invariably, sometimes what will happen to me? The pastor will go to sleep. Sometimes for a moment. Just not off. I'm just hoping and praying that nobody catches me back there asleep. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? Here's the pastor asleep back there. We have that trouble, don't we? By the way, the disciples had that trouble, didn't they? Remember when Jesus was in the garden, the most intense moments of his life before he went to the cross, sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, taking the cup of our sin upon himself? And he said, could you not watch and pray with me one hour? And where were the disciples? They were where you and I would have probably been, asleep. So I have some problems in my prayer life. I'm going to admit it to you. I don't feel like my prayers are effectual and fervent. If you feel like yours are, I need you to help me after service, all right? So how do I avail much in prayer? Well, we're in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also, what's the next word, church? Helpeth our, say it with me, infirmities. Do you know what the word infirmities means? It means our weaknesses. The Holy Spirit helps me in my weaknesses. His ability compensates for my inability notice how it happens for we know not what we should pray for as we ought you hear somebody sick nigh unto death they're suffering sometimes you don't know exactly how to pray do you you're in a situation and you really don't know which direction to go you need wisdom from God and, and, and you don't really know specifically how you ought to pray Maybe sometimes it's such an overwhelming thing that in your heart you, you kind of you know what you want to convey to the Lord, but you don't know how with words to express it. You're just so overcome. You're just not sure exactly what needs to be done and how it ought to be expressed. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. I've got a partner in my prayer life who in spite of my weakness and my inability 
and my laziness and my carnality, in spite of all of that, the Holy Spirit comes aside. He comes beside me and He helps me in my infirmities. He intercedes for me with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. There is a transaction. There is a communion. There is a fellowship and a communication that takes place in prayer that is not just dependent upon your ability to express to God what the need is. No, God the Father is active. God the Son is active. God the Holy Spirit is active. And what is He doing? He's searching your heart and He's searching your mind and He knows the mind and the will of God and the plan of God and He brings all those things together in harmony. The Holy Spirit helps me. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I may miss it, but he never does. And he's there with me. Lord, do you know what this guy's trying to do? You know what Scott's trying to accomplish? You know what's in his heart? You know he doesn't know how to say it? So let me say it for him. You know he's tired, he can't pay attention. He should have been praying more. But let me tell you, dear Father, what he means to say. Aren't you glad you've got somebody helping you like that? It's the Holy Spirit. He's your helper. He's your comforter. Verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, according to his purpose. He helps my Weaknesses. Now, let me ask you a question. If I'm weak, how can I pray effectually and fervently? Because the Holy Spirit's there. He's helping me. Now, let me give you a principle. It's called the power principle. Where'd you discover that? I made it up, but I, I like it. Here is the power principle. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. The power principle. I've got to hurry. I'm never going to get through this. Are y'all in a hurry? 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above, mes- above measure. Rather, Excuse me. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect when, church, in what? For whose strength? My strength. Who's speaking? God is speaking. So whose strength is he referring to here? God's strength. How strong is the Lord? Is he strong enough to take care of you? Is he strong enough to give you ability to do what he wants you to do? Absolutely. My strength is made perfect when? In your what? Weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in my weaknesses, he says, in reproaches, in necessities, You know, when I don't have what I need, when people are ridiculing me, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I what? Well, what are we talking about here? We're talking about prayer that is powerful. But oftentimes when I get up off my knees, I I don't know that it was very powerful. Well, what makes it powerful? The Holy Spirit in me. The Holy Spirit helping me. Why don't we pray? I want to tell you why we don't pray. We don't pray because we don't want to. That's hard for us to admit. But we have flesh. And and, and we're tired. And we don't know how to pray. So therefore the Lord Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to help us pray. And He helps our infirmities. Now He helps us with some things. And let me just give them to you. Quickly, Will you write them down? He helps us with the weakness of your will. 
Let me put it this way. I, I'm identifying with you here, but just, just for semantics sake, he helps you with the weakness of your will. Your will. Now the Bible tells me in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6, for to be carnally minded, that means to be fleshly minded, earthly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Do you know that you and I have a carnal mind and we think according to to the old sin nature. And so it is hard for us oftentimes to think with the mind of Christ. Unless we are yielded to the Holy Spirit in every moment, unless we are filled with the riches of His Word, directing us and controlling our thoughts at all times, then we're subject at times to have the carnal mind. We think things, we develop attitudes that are wrong, and we don't know how to pray as we should. We are not submitted to God in our thinking, but the Holy Spirit helps me with the weakness of my will. Number two, the Holy Spirit helps you with the weakness of your body. I mentioned a moment ago, we get tired, don't we? We get distracted. Sometimes we don't feel comfortable. As we age and grow older, we, we become more familiar with these ailments day by day, right? Our bodies, like gravity, pull the man, the inner man down at times. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Do you know there are many Wednesday nights when you don't feel like going to church, right? I mean, let's be honest. But have you ever noticed when you go, you never regret that you came? I mean, if you're, I, I, I'm the pastor, and there are times I don't want to go to church. I mean, is that okay to admit to you? But sometimes I think, man, I'm, alive. I, I'm not ready to preach, and I don't have clarity about this. And Oh, mercy, can I just stay home? And my wife says, no, you can't. But then we get here, and God meets with us, and the Spirit of God quickens that mortal body. My head was hurting when I got here, but man, I feel good now. I was so tired, but after I met with God's people and heard God's word and spent time in God's presence, I've been energized. I've been, I, I've been fueled in the inner man and the outer man. He helps me. You see the weakness of your body. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I want to tell you what will help the flesh is when you and I spend time with the Lord Jesus. Here's another way he helps us. He helps you. Not only with the weakness of your will and the weakness of your body, but then there's the weakness of your understanding. Romans 8, 26. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We just don't know exactly how to pray. We don't exactly know how uh, to discern the situation. We don't exactly know what to ask for. But God tells us in his word that he will answer our prayers. Now Paul had a prayer for the Ephesian church. And here it is. You can find it in chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. But he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, here's his prayer, he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? What is Paul praying for he's praying for the church that God by his spirit would reveal himself to them and reveal all the treasures of Christ and give them understanding have you ever spoken to someone and uh, they just they just the light hadn't come on yet 
It's not that they're unintelligent. I mean, they may be. But let's imagine they're not. They just haven't developed understanding yet. You know, when you talk to a young person, you try to give them advice, you know, about making a decision in life. Well, I wouldn't do that right now. But, you know, they they really want to do whatever it is they put their mind to do. And so they're not yet really understanding what you're trying to say. But in your mind, here's what you're thinking. Oh, you'll understand someday. Right? Just imagine our understanding in comparison to God's. And the little petty things that we squabble about and the little things that occupy our minds that are not important, the things that divide church members and aggravate church members and get them out of church and get them discouraged, and we just totally miss the point. We need God to open the eyes of our understanding. And the Bible tells me here that while I don't know exactly what to pray for as I ought to, the Holy Spirit will help me. We've been trying to make some some major decisions in our church. We have some good problems. You know what good problems are? You know, we've had some growth and our school has grown and our church is growing even... uh, as, as people now have begun more and more to return to church and we're trying to determine what to do, we need to start more classes and we need more teachers. Well, how are we going to get them? How are we going to make those difficult decisions? What direction do we go? Well, I'll be honest with you. There was a gentleman asked me recently, he says, Pastor, which way are you leaning with all of this? And I said, well, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know that I'm leaning in any direction. I'm more like a leaf blowing in the wind. Or a kite, maybe. Whichever way the wind blows. That's the way I'm getting carried. What am I waiting on? I'm waiting on discernment. I'm waiting on wisdom from God. I'm waiting on God to show me. Don't make a decision when you don't know what to do. Wait on God. He'll show you. And the Holy Spirit helps us with the weakness of our understanding. When we don't understand why we're suffering, when we don't understand why things are going the way they are, when we don't understand why our children won't listen, what is it that we need? We need the Holy Spirit to pray with us to give us understanding. Here's the last one. Aren't you glad? The weakness of our words. Some people are very eloquent. I mean... They're at no loss for words. They always know the right thing to say. Others of us, we struggle. We don't know exactly what to say and when to say it or how to say it. I'm glad to tell you that it does not depend upon the words you say. There was a lady who came to me recently and she said, Pastor, I'm trying to get my prayers answered, but I don't think I'm expressing them the right way. I don't know that I'm using the right words. And I said to her, you don't have to worry about that. It takes a lot of pressure off of us, doesn't it? You see, God doesn't reward us for our eloquence or our ability to state and communicate things. God rewards us as we learn to dwell in His presence. He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him, not eloquently speak to Him. So we find in Romans 8, 26, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes, friends, all you and I know how to do is just fall on our knees and just groan. Because we don't know what to say. Maybe our hearts are too overwhelmed. The pain is too deep. The situation too complex. And the Bible tells us that he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. You see, when we don't know, let me tell you who does know. God knows. Aren't you glad? There's so many things I don't know. And I'm I'm okay admitting that. Because I know the one who does know. And when he's ready, he will make it clear to me. And when I can't communicate to God exactly what I'm trying to say, because I don't really know what I'm trying to say, He is speaking according to perfect knowledge. And what is He doing? He makes intercession for the saints 
according to the will of God. And you know what the Bible says? We have confidence in this, that if we ask anything according to the will of God, what does God say He will do? He will hear us. And He will what? He will answer. Oh, I don't know exactly that I know exactly what the will of God is here in this situation. So I don't know if God hears me. Oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got a friend. I've got a comforter. I've got a helper who comes alongside. And when my language can't communicate clearly the will of God, he interprets for me and matches up my desire with the will of God. And so here we find prayer that is powerful. What makes it powerful? It's not me. It's Him. The Holy Spirit helpeth our infirmities. So when you get down to pray and the devil says, you know that thing, that prayer you offered, it didn't make it past the ceiling. Just look at him and tell him he's a liar. Tell him he's a liar. Put your finger on Romans 8, 26 and say the Holy Spirit is helping my infirmities. Take your Bible and open it to the book of James and say the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It gets much done. It's prayer that is personal. It is prayer that is powerful. And it is prayer that is profitable. It accomplishes much. Well, we got a wonderful example of that, don't we? Verse 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. In other words, he's just a normal guy. We think about Elijah like he's some super saint. No, he's a normal man with the same problems that you have. A temper? Maybe. Prone to depression? Well, we know that. I mean, he was ready to ask God to kill him after he came off the mountain. Prone to fear? Yes. He feared that Jezebel would kill him. So he's got problems just like you and I. He got sleepy while he was praying, sure. He didn't know exactly how to express everything. He was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Why did he pray that? Because he wanted the people to know that God was not happy with their idolatry. And so God honored that request. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months, and he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. Why did he pray that prayer? Because he wanted the people to know who God was. You see, look, when we get concerned, when we get concerned, not with just our little world, but with the glory of God. When we get concerned about that, we'll see God do things. It availeth much. And so let's trust God. Maybe tonight you're having trouble at home, trouble with your spouse trouble with your children, trouble with another brother or sister, trouble on the job. Maybe there's sickness, maybe there's discouragement. Maybe you're not seeing any fruit in that class that you're teaching. Maybe you have gone through a dry season in your spiritual life. And maybe as a church, you want to see God work in such an amazing way. Can I encourage you to answer the invitation that God gives here in James chapter 5? Let him pray. And let's learn to come before God and pray. And let's not quit and get down on ourselves because we're not the best at it. And let's remember that the best at it is with us. Let's pray together. Father, would you help us tonight to be people who pray and to be confident in knowing that you're with us. 
that the Holy Spirit is present and he helps our infirmities. And I pray for the people of this dear church and those who are dealing with trials and afflictions and sickness, those who are merry, those who have faults. And I pray that you would help us to bring those petitions to you. May we be filled with a heart of love and understanding and compassion one for another. And may we learn to pray one for another instead of judging one another, instead of condemning and accusing one another, instead of talking about one another. May we learn, Lord, to talk to you about the needs of our brothers and sisters. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us in our weakness to understand that the prophet in prayer is not dependent upon our power. It's dependent upon yours. And that you, Holy Spirit, help us in our weakness, the weakness of our will, the weakness of our body, the weakness of our understanding, the weakness of our words. You help us. And we thank you for that. Remind these dear folks of this truth tonight. Seal it deep in our hearts. And help us, Lord Jesus, to come to you in the midst of our weakness and find in you the strength that we need and that is available. And may we see in the days ahead, in the weeks and the months to follow this meeting, you do great things. And we look back and we recognize that this work was wrought of our God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our pastor's coming. With heads bowed and eyes closed, gentlemen and ladies up there in the sound room, we're going to switch the song to Sweet Hour of Prayer. Our invitation hymn will be Sweet Hour of Prayer. If you can make that happen, that's great. If not, I'll try and go by memory. The whole time he was preaching, I just kept thinking, I got to get alone and pray. I got to get alone and pray. Do you think the same thing? Do you find that encouragement knowing that it wasn't about your eloquence or how fired up you got or if you did everything right today? Let now at this altar, or if you're unable to come to this altar right there in your seat, let it be the beginning of a new commitment to prayer. Father, have your will and way in this time of invitation. Be glorified, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make sing that second verse together. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, I wing shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness in
together. Father, I thank you for being so merciful to us, so gracious to even make a way for us to pray, and so merciful that you, sounds like you do all about the heavy lifting, all of it, it seems like. We just have to show up. Oh, Father, help us to show up. May much fruit be born through the prayer that comes from a renewed interest, a renewed desire, a new commitment tonight to spend time in prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you for your faithfulness tonight to be here in the Lord's house or to tune in and watch and watch and listen online. I'm glad you've chosen to be with us. I want to encourage you to be with us again tomorrow night. We'll be gathering together here or online if you're joining us that way at 7 p.m. Come with a heart prepared to listen. Come with a heart prepared to be changed, to be challenged, to be made more like the Lord. I've come to church services where people said, boy, wasn't that good? And I said, I didn't get anything out of it. And they said, oh, I, I got tremendous things out of it. You know what happened? They came prepared, and I just showed up. Let's show up expecting, praying for, asking for a blessing. I want to encourage you to keep praying for many families in our church that are going through difficult things and circumstances right now. Pray for Angie Poling as she's mourning the loss of her father. Lift her up in prayer. We'll let you know more details when we know more about that. Pray for the family and friends of Ralph Basil as we're honoring and celebrating his life and memorial services this Wednesday at Sunset Memorial. And they'll receive friends between 9 and 10. And the service will follow there, the interment right there at Sunset. If you're able to be there, uh, come and support one another, support the family. And I thank you for your, your prayers for him. Let's stand together, shall we? Brother Ben, Pastor, would you close us in prayer, please? Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.